Friends, a very warm welcome. Great to have you back joining us. Uh, uh, my name's Ian Paul and I live in Nottingham. James, where do you come from? Who are you? And uh, my name is James Blanford Baker and I'm in Histon and Impington, two villages just north of Cambridge. Fantastic. And friends, um, if you are joining us for the first time, you're very welcome. If you're a, a repeat viewer, then that's fantastic too. Don't forget that uh, down below, I think and here, there's some um, little buttons you can subscribe uh, and also you can click and share. So copy the link and then paste it in social media and spread the word, which will be uh, great for us. We're trying to uh, bring the word to life, looking at lectionary gospel readings and discussing those, uh, usually following a, a commentary that I've put on the blog. Um, but we've got a particular challenge this week, haven't we, James? We certainly have, because I don't think you've written um, a commentary on the gospel passage, which is John 16, 12 to 15. Yes, but uh, I would have done by the time this is videos out. But oh, you would have done. Know. OK, so that's okay. very good. Um, <laughs> so there is, course, a, there is a commentary. Yes, There is a commentary. But the okay. challenge is it's Trinity Sunday. And, uh -huh. uh, and that tends to send all sorts of normally sane and happy clergy and preachers into panic. It does. I've got a lovely rose called a rambling rector, and it's about to flower on Trinity <laughs> Sunday. And somebody <laughs> did comment that rectors are at their most rambling on Trinity yeah. Sunday. So yeah. uh, the, the, so before we we are going to spend a little bit of time looking at, um, right, uh, at John 16, the, the Sunday Gospel Lecture reading, but a couple of things before and after that. Mm. First of all, and I don't know what, what you're going to say in answer to this question, James, I, I might be able to guess. Um, a lot of people are tempted on Trinity Sunday, unlike any other, every other Sunday, to, to leave aside the text of Scripture and to preach on the subject of the Trinity. Hmm. Okay, here's the question. Do you think that's a good idea? In a, in, in a, in a word, no. Oh. I, don't think I don't think it's a good idea. And oh. I, have, I have done it in the past, and that's partly why I don't think it's a good idea. <laughs> I, I, but it obviously I, didn't end happily then <laughs> well no uh, indeed uh, it, it probably didn't help having the regis professor of divinity of the university of cambridge in the congregation at the time but no, that wouldn't um but i think the the thing that strikes me as odd is we we allow ourselves quite rightly to sit under the authority of scripture and the scripture passage in front of us sunday by sunday by sunday suddenly we get to trinity sunday panic throw out the passage talk about the trinity why do we do that because mm. actually the trinity is a doctrine that is derived profoundly we believe as christians from the scriptures so if we right. preach scripture we preach the trinity at least that oh. ought to be uh, the way it works because if we're okay. preaching faithfully the trinity will emerge and okay. so i think um I, I i i don't do this now i don't i don't say oh it's trinity sunday let me tr preach on the trinity <laughs> I, I go for the passage and, and work out what's going on in the passage. So no I don't know what you do. No, what do you do? Here? No, no, you... no three leaf clovers then. No, no, I don't go for three leaf clovers or <laughs> different water, steam and ice. Or, or, no, no, I, just, <laughs> I think these things are really I, I genuinely think these things are actually quite unhelpful. Um, Apart because, from not also being heretical, of course. Uh, yeah, indeed. And but they, but they kind of trivialize things a bit, actually, just by, mm. by uh, because mm -hmm. they, they are, in, are wholly inadequate uh, metaphors. Yeah. So um, but anyway, what, what do you do? I mean, what's your view on this? I mean, I don't know if you No, I, I, I wouldn't preach on the Trinity and I for entirely the same reasons, which is that I'd say we ought to be we ought to be preaching right. on the Trinity every Sunday. Now, what I do, I do do something slightly different. Well, I mean, you may be doing this as well, but but because I don't believe in preaching on the Trinity on Trinity Sunday, unless we're having a theology seminar, as it were, yeah. Um, yeah, I yeah. do teach on the Trinity. When I teach a, a, a year three module on themes in biblical theology, one of the one of the subjects is the Trinity. Right. Um, and I've written on the Trinity. So I've got a, yes. we, we'll come back to this. Um, I contributed a chapter to this book here, uh, The Trinity Without Hierarchy. It was originally going to be called Trinity Without Tears, which is going to, ha ha, get the joke? Yeah, tears, yeah, yeah. tears, tears, tears. Yeah. Okay. Um, but the publisher wouldn't allow that. So, uh, and I've, I've written a chapter on the Trinity in the book of Revelation, which we might come back to. Uh, yes, at the end. interesting. Um, because mm. I think the book of Revelation, uh, being the most Christian book in the New Testament, is the most... <laughs> Is the most trinitarian the most explicitly trinitarian well you would say that yeah well, i would say that of course i would but it's true and mm -hmm. people can see my commentary as a result of that um but the what because of that um because of the principle that if we're preaching scripture we're preaching the trinity yeah what i'm now in the habit of doing is along with another another big theme in my preaching I, i'm now in the habit of of making the connections making trinitarian connections yeah. whenever there's an opportunity to do that and of course we've in many of these passages we've been looking at in yeah. uh, the fourth gospel there's been an, an opportunity to do that mm. um so i'm actually bringing it out the other the other thing that i'm currently sort of feeding into my preaching is this whole thing about 
Jewish Christian relations and the idea that, the, that uh, and rejecting the idea that the church displaces yeah, yeah. Judaism yeah, and yeah, that yeah. Jesus was throwing out the law and all that kind of stuff. So again, yeah. that's another, those are two things where I'm always thinking when I'm preaching, yeah. can I just draw out, can I just, when, when there's an issue in the passage, which relates to one of those two things, can I just bring that out and make it a bit more explicit so that in my preaching and our reading, we, we actually notice those things. Yeah. And I think, I think that's a, it's a really good thing to do, isn't it? Because both of those things are things that have, got distorted or misunderstood in mm. in the sort of almost embedded culture of christianity really mm. and and we do actually keep on needing to sort them out and I, i'm sure like me you have people folk in in your congregation who who constantly tell me that the, there's no point in reading the old testament because uh, you yes. know and, and actually I, so i'm con so in counter to that i'm constantly pointing out the old testament references in the new testament yeah, passage exactly. um because i I'm, actually I had that very conversation last sunday morning Right. Okay. And I was okay. preaching, yeah. uh, and awesome. I and I connect. I connected yeah. Pentecost and the, yeah. and, yeah. and the and and the Spirit um, being. Uh, my my three points were the Spirit comes from Jesus. The Spirit points to Jesus, and the Spirit makes Jesus real. What Jesus has done real for us. Yeah. And in order to, to talk about the Spirit coming from Jesus, I didn't just look at the verses in the fourth gospel which say that, but I, I went back to Ezekiel's vision of the temple, yes. where the water of life flows from the side of the temple. And then in the fourth gospel, Jesus identifies himself as the temple. Yeah. And that's why blood and water flows from yeah. his side. And, yeah. and a person came up to me and said, well, I was really glad you mentioned the Old Testament because I find the Old Testament very difficult. It's just so boring, isn't it? I said, oh. I said so, oh. so we did address, we did address that and I reckon yeah, I guess. In some guess. Bible project videos. So yeah. probably you should mention that. Yeah. We all to get on, should we have a look at um, yeah. the, lectionary gospel reading set for trinity sunday which yeah. is yeah john 16 uh 12 to 15 so just three verses from from john's or four verses from john's gospel yeah that is a very short reading mm. is it possible to preach a sermon just on four verses i suppose so it's the fourth gospel it, it, exactly um there's, and, there's and, lots there and it's very profound, uh, of course, um, but it's yeah, it's interesting. It's we do seem to in the lecture to get quite short passages from John around uh, these philosophy we points. We've been several times when this has happened. I think we do. Yeah, I think my observation is first of all, when, when you get a short passage, it's really important to look at the context. You know, the verses yeah. before and after, and the context here is Jesus reiterating some key issues around the the giving of the Holy Spirit yeah uh so we we read just a couple of verses earlier in verse seven if i go i will if i do not go away the helper will not come yeah. but if i do go i will send him to you and i suppose i want to then make the connection with uh trinity pentecost back to the ascension that the whole point of the ascension is that jesus is enthroned and he's now seated at the right hand of the father and from there the well be right. because we are because we're westerners the spirit proceeds from father yeah. and son yeah uh yeah. so that um the, oh, it, it is interesting that i just noticed in chapter 14 and chapter 16 at some points jesus says i am sending the spirit and other points jesus says i will ask the father and the father will send the spirit. the spirit yeah so in acts it's the promise of the father they're waiting for but, yeah. but in in at certain points in the fourth gospel yeah. it's jesus himself who sends the spirit yeah which is significant yeah yeah now um beginning of our was there anything else we need to say about context the, the immediate context of these verses well i mean i think the only other thing is just about the context in, in what jesus says in the, in the very next verse like that verse eight where it, it, it it's he tells us what the spirit will do and about convicting mm -hmm. the the world about sin and righteousness and judgment mm -hmm. and i think actually grasping the 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 kind of action of the spirit uh, in the world, in our lives, and so on, is is really important just to understand what is being said in these in these verses that we've got in front of us this mm. week. Mm. I kind of have often read that for myself as saying, the Spirit tells you what's good, what's bad, and how to tell the difference. Yeah, yeah, and well, that's too simplified. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it strikes me as really important, though, and, and and it's interesting that you know in the in the charismatic movement i mean that's been you know years ago that was a really important aspect of understanding when the spirit was present in 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 the worshiping community that that was what the spirit did and i mm. i don't know if that's been lost a bit uh i think that we we we, we can quite easily domesticate um the action of the spirit and and you know that's that's problematic 
And we did mention last week as well that it's very striking, I think, and, and, and interesting on the blog, I got some pushback on this, that, that the image of the Holy Spirit is, is or the Holy Spirit in the New Testament is associated with fire in a way that isn't present in the Old Testament. So there is something yeah. about judgment and about cleansing and purification, Yes, which, yeah. which is, again, it's, it, it's something I, th I think you're right. I think we shy away from, actually. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. And we talked about holiness, didn't we, in, in that context? We did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, Jesus says at the beginning of our reading, I have still many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. Now, did you read that as being something to do with the emotional weight of the moment? Because all this trauma is happening and Jesus is going and they're all going, oh, my goodness, what are we going to do? And, and then Jesus is anticipating his death. Or is this to do with the limitations of Jesus teaching the Gospels? Or how did you read that? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? I mean, um, there's a very interesting word study in David Ford's new commentary on John's Gospel mm. uh, about this word bear, oh, um, okay. where he says it, he basically there's a very quick survey of how it's used in the New Testament. Mm. And he says it's always associated with suffering. So it's it's um, you bear children, but you bear children in pain. Right. You Jesus bears the cross. Of course, um, we are to bear one another's burdens. Right. Um, Paul is told that he will uh, by Ananias that he will, um, uh, you know, th the word, the word, the word of uh, th God through Ananias that he will um, be bearing Jesus name before the Gentiles and suffer mm. for for yeah. Jesus sake. So there's a very yeah. strong, strong element of suffering through following Jesus. And I, I think I, I think that's quite a helpful um, thing to unlock here. Uh, this, this this text, it, it's actually something about you don't have the capacity to um, suffer, as it were, these things now, or mm. understand the suffering that will come through following me now. Yeah. But you will, you will, in in due course, when I have suffered for you, and and that's a interesting little piece. Of that work. strikes me as really rather important because one of the things I found in this passage was it was quite hard to sort of get to grips, get a purchase on what was what was happening. Yeah. And I think part of that is we tend to dislocate this and the other other texts in in the farewell discourse from the context of Jesus with his disciples on the night he was betrayed yeah, 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 uh, yeah and just jumping on to verse 13 one of my other major questions it says that, that the spirit will declare to you the things that are to come now from our context we mm -hmm. immediately think oh that's all to do with the end of the world yeah yeah but actually i was looking at colin cruz's commentary in the tyndale series which i got yes. here and he, his commentary was actually very helpful on this uh it's actually <laughs> it's actually one of the better commentaries on the text here because he actually does pay attention to what the words are doing and so on mm. uh, rather than getting lost and and he, and he he did say, look, this is the, these are the things that are about to come. These are the things that are about to happen to Jesus and about to happen to the disciples, and they're going to be scattered and then so on. And it's going to yeah. be this really traumatic moment until Jesus is raised and then the, the spirit yeah. comes and so on. So, again, the things that are to come is, is really talking about what's now going to happen once Jesus uh, yeah. the, is the, the cross and, and resurrection. And yeah, and so on. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, um, I mean, the other word that I think is, is interesting um, there in verse 13, it says he will guide guide you into all the truth uh, the spirit's yeah. role almost is, is, a, is a, as a teacher and uh, to a pupil and I suppose the, the interesting thing about teachers and pupils is that, that the teacher doesn't tell you everything in one go the teacher mm. guides you towards understanding and knowledge and mm. I mean I remember my, my Latin teacher when I was eight um, he used to. He you used did to Latin us, when you were eight. I did. Uh, sadly, uh, very, very sadly. Um, uh, I don't think I'm sorry about actually, this. But... I apologise, my friend James. Here, but never mind. <laughs> you can't help the way you're brought up, can you? No, you can't. I, I'm a, I was a victim <laughs> as much as anything. Um, but the interesting thing about this was he always said, "I'm going to tell you a little white lie now," and it would be about some piece of grammar because yeah. he was simplifying things for us, which he would then explain later, in, in, yeah. in, in as we got as we got more advanced. And I think. That, that impression comes to me here because oh. th there is so much to bear uh, in our understanding of what it means to be a followers of Jesus that we couldn't we couldn't cope with it all now. And actually, if we look back yeah. on our own de biographies, that's that's profoundly true. So th there's my, my that, parallel to that will be in chemistry, where you learn about an atom with electrons whizzing around, which are little bu bubbles. Then you learn at a level that actually it's all sort of gas clouds. And then you if you go on to do quantum mechanics, you say it's all probability spaces. But it's, it's the same kind of progression, isn't <laughs> yeah, it? You have absolutely. a simplified view at the beginning yeah. and then you actually engage with. Yeah. And actually, then you then you go past quantum mechanics. You know, we haven't got a clue what it is anyway. So there we are. <laughs> yes. But, um, yeah. Yes. 
Yeah. Uh, just, I'm really interested in picking up this word guide because just, mm. just looking at the Greek word is um, hodegese, which is yeah. hodos. So it's, it's, hodos and ago, yeah. yeah. It's leading you in the way. Now, again, what, just going back to what we talked about, about the relationship between the Old Testament and the New Testament, I love the idea of guiding you in the way because, in a sense, that's what Torah is about. Torah isn't about law in the way that we think of law. It's about, no. it's about uh, throwing it as it were ahead of you and saying, look, this is the way to, this is the way you should walk. This is the, the conduct yeah. of your life. And, and of course in, in Jewish ethical teaching, um, that, that the, the walking is, the, is, is the metaphor for, uh, yeah. uh, for the whole thing about how you live out yeah. faith and obedience to God. Yeah. There's, there's two other interesting things here. Um, the spirit of truth comes, uh, now that picks up once we get to Jesus's so-called high priestly prayer in chapter 17, by which time they're, they're actually uh, outside uh, actually they're already they, they've already sorry i'm getting distracted here i shouldn't get distracted uh, at the end of the uh, chapter 14 it says uh, let us arise and go from here everyone says that's a disruption to the text but po it's perfectly reasonable to say they've actually left the upper room and they're now walking through the city yeah. and heading out towards the um, mount yeah. of mount of olives um but the uh everyone says oh well jesus's final prayer was that we should be one even as he and the father one but actually jesus says sanctify them in the truth your word is truth that they may be one mm. so jesus doesn't let go of this it's interesting again that here we've got the language of the spirit of truth which is really significant in mm. the fourth gospel about mm. you know who's telling the truth the true witness the yeah. accusations the sense of it being a whole sort of lead up to the trial narrative in front of Pilate, yeah. and and people's uh, again I, I i don't know if you've heard this people say well scripture says this but jesus said the spirit would lead us into all truth so scripture is only the beginning and the spirit is leading us on into new things. So I don't know how you respond to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but, but I mean, I think for John, that in, in a sense, the, the, the scriptures are revealing the truth to us. And this, this is what the whole point of him writing, the, writing it down is, is so that um, it, it's there before us. Uh, and and so it, it, the spirit of truth is always going to lead us back to scripture because the scriptures contain uh, the truth for us and uh, and that's um uh, that seems to me uh yeah very, really important once we start dislocating uh, truth from the, the anchor in the scriptures anybody can go off anywhere on that um and that's caused us all sorts of problems well just remembering this is trinity sunday we also get into a bit of a problem don't we where we get jesus saying one thing on the one hand and the spirit saying something different so mm, yeah which yeah, again yeah. jesus rules out yeah and um okay. just a couple of chapters earlier the material which is very similar to chapter 16 in chapter 14 verse 26 the helper the holy spirit whom the father will send in my name there we've got the father sending it in jesus's name um he will teach all things you all things and bring to your remembrance all that i have said to you so yeah, that's yeah, very yeah. emphatic isn't it yeah very um, now this brings us to the word paraclete paracletos yeah now some yeah. bibles translate it helper yeah, others yeah. advocate yeah others comforter yeah and if you've got a preferred translation yeah i mean uh i i think the one called alongside is a, is one which is not used in the scriptures is it but it's yeah. kind of um it comes from the from the word paraclete and Paracaleo, yeah. Yeah, I think that actually is a more helpful uh, hmm. idea. Um, ad advocate has a quasi sort of judicial. Legal, judicial, it does. Yeah, which, which probably is a bit unhelpful, although, though it, you know, we all need advocates. I mean, that's that's absolutely right. Yeah. Um, comforter focuses on a on, on a different um, area of human experience, mm. and, and, and that's true as well. But um, mm. none of these words adequately uh encompass all that the spirit does really do they yeah yeah but the, the lectionary does does give that one one that's been called alongside as a as a primary meaning or right, one who okay. appears on yeah. another's behalf so yeah. Yeah. one little thing that i'm <laughs> i'm really fascinated by is that uh in the rabbinic tradition um it was um it was suggested that the it was claimed that the messiah would have the name menachem right we know that name uh, Menachem Begin was a, a, a prime minister of Israel uh, because the word Menachem it begins with them. It's a participle means com means comforter. Mm. And uh, of course, Jesus says, and again, in chapter 14, I will send another comforter, Alos Par Paracletos, uh, another one like him. So he is and, and he is in, in one John. You know, we have an advocate. We have a, a, a Paracletos yeah. with the yeah. father. Yeah. 
who pleads for us so for the forgiveness of yeah, sins yeah. so yeah. the spirit is a paraclete as jesus has been a paraclete so yeah. the spirit is one who comes alongside as jesus has been alongside so again there's the the fact that the presence of the spirit is a thing that makes jesus presence yeah. real to us yeah and, and uh, i mean dare we say it, that there's something trinitarian beginning to be expressed Emerge. there isn't there there is mm. and that comes out it seems to me uh, in the uh, last of the four verses we've got in our reading all the father has his has, mind therefore yeah. i said that he will take what is mine declare it to you so yeah. the spirit is taking what is jesus is and what is jesus is what the father is yeah. and the spirit then mediates it to us yeah. so yeah yeah um is there anything else from that passage you want to draw it i know you've been looking at the david ford commentary uh yeah no that, i think i think we've we've picked up quite a few things i think um that that idea he will glorify me because he will take what is mine is is mm. is picked up again of course in the subsequent chapters isn't it yes. um so th that's uh, a theme which yeah. you know is is very much there in john that yeah. the that the um father glorifies the son the, the son is glorified um in the father and and, and the spirit glorifies jesus so yeah. all this thing is kind of going around again um once again very trinitarian shape to that language yeah yeah mm. great well there's actually slightly more to unpack there than perhaps we thought um mm. now <laughs> uh, let's just quickly then finish by looking at a couple of other issues so um one of the things well we're avoiding preach on the trinity at all yes but again in particular um i think i would want to avoid again something we find quite common in preaching which is the idea that um the reason why the trinity is important is that the trinity is a community of love <laughs> And we, the church, are a community of love, and we're a community of love, which is based on the community of love of the Father. So that's what we learn from the Trinity. Mm -hmm. Do you find that helpful? Do you know, I don't actually. Um, and I, I mean, there's, there's lots of good reasons, I think, probably why, why people don't find it helpful. And I mean, one, one very obvious reason is that our experience of human relationships is absolutely nothing like uh any perception of what the relationships might be in the trinity or how god is um because our um you know in the trinity the persons of the trinity as we know from 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 the nicene creed are are, are of, of one substance, one substance. With, with, with each other and one thing that's patently obvious in human experience is we are not the same substance <laughs> as each other. Um, so that that you know that's that's a it, it's a very different uh, we we have a are operating in a very different way. And um, I, I think I think you point out actually in one of one of your blogs mm. that actually a much better um, image of what it means for us to relate to one another mm. is the uh, model of the incarnation. Right. OK. Yeah. I, mean, I don't because, know if you want to say something about it, but I think that's. Yeah, I do, uh, because um, it, I find it very interesting that um, I can't think of a place in Scripture where, where we're commanded to love one another as God loves God. No, no, no. <laughs> so what we're commanded to do is we love one another as God has loved us. Yes. Yes. so it's about loving that which is other than you not yes. loving that which is like you yes we, we need to love uh, the difference a different person it, it, yeah. indeed and you're going across from one person to another you're loving someone who has a separate distinct will from yeah. you and a different agenda yeah. and a different so on uh and and of course if you are going to say well the trinity is a community like human human community is a community you are actually having to say that the trinity is three Per, separate persons and so you're actually getting into tritheism yeah. there now I, this week we don't want to get set too many hairs running but this 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 sort of stuff is drawn on in all sorts of other debates um a great book that i found is um this one by stephen holmes who's a baptist in scotland and uh, the quest for the trinity i think the, mm. it's, that's the american mm. title the, the uk Very title is slightly different than ivp but 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 he goes through the history of the discussion about trinity and um he is actually a little bit scathing about this whole rise of social trinitarianism where yeah. we see the, the the which we find in maltman which find in zizulas and other people um and just on on this article i'll just share this text here um which is from my um blog post which you refer to called the trinity is not our social program and i cite a number of different folks i cite um uh, stephen holmes another book here really helpful uh, called trinitarian theology for the church but also kevin giles kevin giles article on trinity and he says this he says the way in which the three divine persons relate to one another in eternity is neither a model for nor prescriptive of human relationships in the temporal world. God's life in heaven does not set a social agenda for human life on earth. 
divine relations in eternity cannot be replicated on earth by created human beings and fallen beings at that. What the Bible asks disciples of Christ to do, both men and women, is to exhibit the love of God to others and to give ourselves in self-denying sacrificial service and self-subordination, as the Lord of glory did in becoming one with us in our humanity and dying on the cross. In other words, the incarnate Christ provides the perfect example of godly living and not the eternal life of God, specifically appealing to the doctrine of the Trinity, a threefold perfect divine communion to support either the equality of men and women or their hierarchical ordering is mistaken and should be opposed. So there yeah, you go, yeah. Kevin Giles is saying that that very yeah. clearly. Yeah. So um, we were going to talk a little bit about Book of Revelation. Um, I think we might be a bit short of time on that. We got carried away by discussion. Yeah, we did. we did. Um, but again, I, there's a little um, uh, a chapter, uh, sorry, an article on the blog here where I just explore the significance of um, the the scenes on the, the worship scenes in chapters four and five. Yeah. Um, which I know you read. I think you found it quite striking, didn't you? Yes, I thought I thought you 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 you, put, you point out that at the end of um, chapter five, I think there's this. Um, this uh, the, the part part one of the part of the hymn of uh, the, the, the hymn of praise is where, where the text says to the one seated on the throne and to the lamb be blessing and honor and glory and might and this is one of the places in the new testament mm. where where the, where the, the, where the, the father and the son are equally worshipped um mm. that's i thought that was very very interesting and there is only one throne and who sits on the throne both the one seated but, on the throne yeah and the lamb Yes. And there's one throne, and in yeah. in the uh, and again in in chapter 21, 22, the single river of life, which I think is a symbol of the spirit, flows from the oh, single throne of yeah. the the, the um, God and the Lamb. Oh, and, and and this is really significant because the other thing that Revelation four and five is doing is completely unseating any human pretenses to worship. Yes. Again, if you read it in context, it's a it's the worship of God over against any worship of a human figure yeah. an emperor particularly yeah. and so it's even more striking that the figure of the lamb actually is found on the throne because no human figure can do so yeah i think i argue that's a, yeah. a high high christology there. yes that's well, well course, worth to read that blog yeah it is and again you can you can buy the book as well yeah. and of course there's the the trinitarian introduction at the beginning where yeah. john sends greetings from the one who is was was to come from the seven spirits before the throne and from Jesus Christ, the firstborn of the dead and ruler of the kings of the earth, which is also, I think, highly Trinitarian. Because actually, Paul's greetings tend to be binitarian rather than Trinitarian. Yes, they do. Yeah. yeah. Uh, from, from God the Father and from Jesus Christ. Mm. Last thing is, uh, just to refer to another resource for folk, and we'll link this uh, below as well in the blog, um, delightful little essay by Mike Higdon, yes. uh, who's yes, professor wonderful. of ministerial training at Durham. And he did actually preach on the Trinity. So he did what we suggest you might not want to do, but he did it in, he wants to show that you can actually make it explicable. So he preached a whole sermon in words of one syllable. Yes. Yeah. And he was so strict, he couldn't say the word syllable. So somebody else had to say that because syllable hasn't got one syllable. <laughs> that, that's real commitment, isn't it? It is. It I is. would expect nothing less than Mike from Mike, frankly. Yeah. <laughs> and he just finishes it. And I'll just, uh, I might just share this paragraph and this is where we uh, might need to draw things to a close. So he says this, uh, just as a conclusion for his sermon that so there is god the one to whom we pray the one to whom we look to whom we call out the one who made the world and loves all that has been made and then there is god by our side god once more the one with whom we pray god in the life of this man who shares our life this man who lives the life of god by our side and who pours out his life in in love for us and then there is God in our hearts, God in our guts, God one more time, the stream in which we dip our toes, the stream in which we long to swim, the stream which fill the sun and can fill us too and bear us in love back to our source. Mm. And all said in words of one syllable. One syllable. James, very good to explore these things with you. We could talk for a lot longer, but... We've got to bear in mind the patience of our viewers. Yeah. Friends, very good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Don't forget to uh, click the link on below to share it to other people. And down below here, and also I think on the screen here, probably in front of James's face, is another link you can click on just to say subscribe, and we'll see you in the future. So, James, thanks very much. Goodbye. Thank you. Friends, thank you very much for watching, and we'll see you again next time.